everyone, and welcome to Tapping Your Creativity. Not in my studio, but in Edward Lynch's studio today. I am so excited to welcome everyone here in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. I am so happy and finally realizing my dream of being in the first studio live with the artist. So thank you, Ed, thank so you. much for having us uh, today or having me today. And uh, I just want to tell you all that we're being super careful and we took our temperatures and we're good to go. So I'm going to actually have Ed remove his own mask. Are you which ready? we're going to talk about them um, later uh, at the end of the program because he is actually designing this mask and selling them. So I'm going to tell you all about that and he's going to talk about that project. But for now, um, welcome Ed to Tapping Into Your Creativity. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I think it's just uh, amazing what you're doing. Um, you know, I was saying about artists, you're doing everything right. Relevance, a great value position, you're, you know, it, it's, it's you're serving the greater good, it's something you love doing. I mean, all top level experience, I think. It's wonderful. And I've enjoyed some of the, uh, uh, some of the artists that I've seen you interview as well. Yes, so I am, I mean, I'm thrilled and I feel honored that you're joining my army of artists. <laughs> Just let's start with your name, who you are, and um, Edward are. Lynch, a big time artist. Yes, yes. Uh, I, uh, Where uh, were you born? Um, uh, I was born in California, um, but I'm you know a St. Paul boy, really born and bred. And uh, um, my mom, when she had she got pregnant with me, and she was like 19, or and uh, maybe even 18, and. Uh, her and, and she married my dad and, and they, you know, went to California, you know, in a couple of things of dreams. And anyway, um, uh, I was born there and then they named me after my grandfather, which was her dad, and uh, and it was okay to come home. <laughs> and then I've been here, but I've lived all over and, you know, but I, I really consider myself a St. Paul boy. <laughs> so tell us when you started to think that art was something that you were attracted to? Well, it's interesting how you remember certain things when you don't remember a lot, you know? <laughs> but uh, um, when I was little, I mean, like 10 years old, I, I um, my grandma uh, used to go, used to walk, you know, everything walked every way once. There was a little, like a little open outdoor kind of a mall kind of a place. And they had just a real, you know, amateur kind of an art fair, and I saw this work, and she just couldn't even leave, and I just looked at it, and looked at it, and looked at it, and I just said, hey, I'm going to be an artist, you know, I know I can do this, and um, she got me some stuff, and I used to steal pencils from the bowling alley, because they had the big, thick leads on them. Yes, they did. And, and so I was drawing, and I started drawing faces and different things, and I think I entered that Contest. I don't know if anybody remembers this a long time ago where it was like draw the bunny and the deer and the thing and send it in to this mail order thing with the stamp yeah. and uh, see if you had art talent to you know whatever Did you win? and uh, and so I got this thing and they sent it back you know and I and I was you know I was confident and then uh, and then later on um, I was like maybe between uh, about 13 14 years old about 14 and uh, I rode my bike with all my stuff. Um, all of, you know, I had my first portfolio, you know, and I used to take the bus to buy stuff and I would get paper and different things, you know, that I worked in. Um, I brought it to this atelier uh, that had two women that taught art classes, much like, kind of like the mastermind you have in Minneapolis, like you're a casket artist and yep. things like that, you know. You have, uh, uh, there was a lady that in the old studio where I was about 10 years ago had that, a great group of artists she did you know, atelier stuff. And uh, I said, my name is Eddie Lynch, I'm gonna be a great artist. And I said, I need painting lessons. And they just kind of smiled like, really, you do? <laughs> I said, but please look at my stuff. I'm serious, you know, look at my stuff. And I, okay, and so I bugged them a little bit. And so then they took a look and showed it to the ladies and they're looking and then she calls her husband, who's a professor at the University of Minnesota. 
And next thing I was like, hey, you know, we want to call your parents and, you know, we'd like to actually give you private lessons and, you know, what do you need? And, and you have to understand, I was really poor. My mom worked six days a week, taking that bus stop and everything. I was the oldest of three boys. And uh, so I said, well, I'm going to be in trouble because I rode my bike. And where do you live? You know, that's a long ways. But anyway, she got over it. And honest God, they took me to art fairs. And I would draw portraits for 30 bucks. <laughs> and so people. you would sit down and, and have yeah, your own I little had a chair and then I had some pieces and, and I dragged home this piece of plywood from a construction site and popped it up with a couple of boards and made a desk in the basement that was just an unfinished, you know, block and concrete basement. And, uh, and you know, that's where I started. And, uh, um, they, uh, and then by the time I got into junior high, I had great mentors, high school, an incredible mentor and teacher I'm still friends with today. He's a, I think he's a fabulous artist. And, you know, and that was it. I, it was my, it, it Your was a calling. Step of it, love was, of it was art. just, yeah, yeah, I just, I absolutely, yeah. that was, you, you have to understand too that you need an identity, you know, something like that. You were good at sports or you were good at math or you were on the debate team or whatever. Art was my identity. And I was like, I am going to be a great artist, and I, and I just had to do it. I love it. But that's why I love teachers so much, because when you have an amazing teacher, it, oh, absolutely. it really can open something for you that you didn't know that you have. And I had that experience when I was in Florence, Italy, and I was studying through this um, maestro, and he showed me the way and the love of art. Mm -hmm. And I can't thank him enough, because right. he gave me my life, what my passion for life. You have to pay it forward. You and have that's, to pay that's, it forward. And that's what you're doing. You know? yeah. I mean, you yeah. pay it forward. Yes, you know? yes. So thank you for the, all the incredible teachers out there and um, that, that, you know, instill in us the love of art. And um, so now you go to college, right? And what happens? Um, well, you know, I had a really good run in high school because of this teacher. And he gave me my own, well, once, first of all, if you've been in the back of the studio, I make a mess. I gave up trying to be clean a long time ago. Yeah. You know, I make just a hell of a mess. And I was so prolific at making just, you know, hundreds of pieces, literally. And, um, and he gave me my own room. He, he gave, there was a, you know, it was a big school. So he gave me my own room so it could just contain the mess. Because wow. he didn't want me to, to not, you know, he wanted me to work. And somebody's ever talking, well, could you just be a little less messy and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had just a great bunch of breaks. I won... I won at the State Fair in Minnesota. I won a, an award for a piece there. I won the Best 100, which was this uh, statewide art contest. Got Best of Show on the Cover Award, which was like 800 bucks. And then the mayor of St. Paul went to this thing and bought this, uh, this uh, set. It was like a triptych or something like that. And, um, and he bought it and gave me this you know, uh, extra like accommodation. Wow. And then I won the MCAD, um, uh, you know, portfolio scholarship. So the MCAD the, of the Minneapolis College of Art and Design that Minneapolis I Art am Design. actually a graduate from. Yeah, yeah. So, my alma mater. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I won that and, um, you know, and so it was, uh, you know, it was the beginning of, you know, something, you know, but uh, it was great validation. I mean, those validations, I think that, um, you know, that's really important. I mean, you know, having a supportive mom is, goes a long way, but somebody in the industry, and especially, I think, you know, other artists, your tribe are other artists, you know? And I mean, I've had, you know, I think those are some of the best memories in the last 20 years, is artists where I say, oh, I'm so-and-so, I say, I know who you are. You know, I say, wow, this is nice stuff. And, and you know, uh, Donald Sutherland, for instance, when pose, picture with me, Ed Moses, uh, uh, saw the work and, you know, was asking questions and, you know, yeah, I'm Ed Moses, and I know who you are, <laughs> you know, and so, you, you, cool. know, it, you know, and so having a big dealer or a person that's buying something, that's great validation, but, you know, there's something special about your own, you know, you find Artist your Artist community, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I mean, when I started this project, I literally called my friends and I said, would you, jump into this leap of faith with me and trust me, mm -hmm. you know, while, while we do this together and we learn um, at the same time. And my community of artists responded like that. And right. they said, absolutely, I'm there. 
Well, and your I network is very impressive. Me. There's no doubt. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's an incredible network. And, uh, you know, I think that, especially now, people have to always say yes. That's, you know, you have to, a leap of faith is where stuff happens. Saying you, you have to have the trust that I am going to do this and I'm going to make two canvases when I only have one so I can experiment and go this way, that way, you know, it's a process, we're going to do this together, um, you know, if you, you have to, the leap of faith is everything, especially in art, I mean, we're gamblers, right? we gamble. And getting out of our comfort zone yeah, all the time yeah. and pushing that limit to be our best selves. Absolutely. And so, um, so going back into your 20s. Um, tell us what's going on in the art world. Where are you? How are you positioning yourself? Are you traveling? Where um, are you at this point? Well, you know, it really wasn't. Um, uh, I really uh, got into uh, design, build, and construction. What happened was that you need the studio, okay? And um, you know, there no, I, I was not into grants. I was really um, art for me was my ticket out of 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 kind of a poor, you know, poor situation, you know, a, a you know, crappy house and, you know, I mean, no money and the rest of it. It was like, it was like kind of like being good at sports. It was like, that's your ticket out of, you know, kind of poverty, you know? And uh, uh, so my 20s, you know, you need the studio. And, and I grew up kind of in a product of the trades. And so I got out of art school and, um, uh, the only way to really get the studio now was to go into construction and do what I was best at, which was, um, you know, high-end detail work. And so I went into carpenter's apprenticeship so I could get my card. And pretty soon I was running jobs. And then basically that was giving me the money to have the studio. And then I ended up going independent and creating my own shop and my own crew of guys and doing stuff. And I was always doing art, but I got, when you get into construction, you're in the business of that. You're chasing checks, you know, it's hard. You're not, you're not full time in the art. And so at a certain point, um, uh, I had been in the construction, I had made money, I built some things, and then I applied for this fellowship uh, in uh, Paris. And I was like, basically, okay, you know, I am using this, to, my ticket out so I can go full time artist and the rest of it. I went to Paris and uh, some time there. Um, then the woman of, I always, you know, my dreams is like from St. Paul, finally got married and I came back and still doing some construction, but there was kind of a line in the sand where basically it's like, okay, I'm not, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. You know, I'm going to get out of that and go full time to art. And so there was a time there, it was always, you know, challenging, but there was a time where I just kind of loaded up the truck and, and head out on the road, you know, got, you know, rent a truck and get my first kind of breaks and stuff. And, and so it really took, really took till I was about 30 to really make any traction as far as getting good galleries, getting representation. Um, Can you talk about that? How was the beginning of that? How did you start that? Oh, you yeah. know, the wheel always turns. I mean, it's very amazing. I mean, you know, you, uh, galleries that aren't in existing now that, you know, like you, as an artist, you put people on pedestals. You, you have this perception that someone could be so great for your career. All you need is just the and I'm just saying, how can I, you know, you know, and, and I like a lot of artists, like, wow, my stuff is good. How come I there? And, you know, it took a long time and then you just, but, but you have to find that one connection, you find a connection and it just happens, you know, and I mean, um, how did it uh, happen for you? Well, it, it's, it's serendipitous, you know, I mean, it happens, um, you ever read the, the book, the stars uh, aligned. well, yeah, you ever read, uh, you ever read Malcolm Gladwell's, uh, the tipping point yes. where he talks about your strongest connection yes. as your weakest Weakest. link, yes. you know, yes. and the, the separation. So it wasn't like the friend of your uncle's or your neighbor's brother or something like that. It was always just convoluted, but it seemed magical the way that you would come across someone. And um, yeah, and it just, you know, met this one and that one and, 
And uh, Were you in was still, at the time? I, yeah, or? still, it's still in Minneapolis. I had traveled and done some things, but uh, you know, had a few different shows and things. And but, but the real break really didn't happen until I uh, went all in and just risked everything, you know. And, and you have to risk everything and lose it. I mean, I believe in that. The artist, you can go. There's a fork in the road. One is kind of leads to academia where you're looking for permission, you know, it's like you're, you don't have as much control and the entrepreneurial where it's taking more control yourself. And at the time in the gallery thing, this was hard. You could not, you could not be a business guy and an artist at the same time. This was, this was taboo. It's changed a lot now where I think those forks have come together. And you see that, that the hustlers like Jeff Koons and Damien Hurst and stuff, listen, these guys are doing more than just, you know, painting or, you know, doing art. There's a, there's a bigger picture there. But in any case, um, put it all in. I started working, I was working a lot of paper, works on paper, and then I had to have the frame shop because otherwise I'm, every time somebody bought something, the framer's making a thousand dollars. You know, it's like, well, I need, <laughs> I need to make frames. And the too, good thing is you know? that we have the trade you know, and, and, right. to and, help you. And I had the shop, and so right. it was like, you know, cabinets and furniture and, piece of furniture which really helped me make the transition to go to Paris and to get out of it because I had an invention that I had royalties on and it was a great thing that, uh, that really helped. It was a, they called the weathermation system with uh, Pan Am and uh, had a great deal. It was a super contract and that's the other thing about artists and your tribe and your, your mentors and your, and your clients. It's like, I get these clients and, you know, one happens to be an expert lawyer on this and the other one has to be an expert doctor on that. I mean, one of my clients saved my life, you know, to be an absolute miracle. So, so you get this, this group of people around you and, and when you're ready, the help is always there. The help, there's, there's help always there and you, and you never know where it's coming from. And uh, so I loaded up everything, went to California, got into, had a great break from a promoter, uh, owns art fairs, putting in these big art fairs, um, and, um, and he gave me a booth, and it wasn't supposed to. He said, well, we'll just wake up a gallery name, but I really want your art to get out there. I really want people to see this work. And there were big galleries from New York and LA and Palm Desert. It was in Palm Springs, and there were good galleries from there and even internationally. And, um, you know, and people, you know, walked up. I had a major dealer walk up and said, this is heads above anything in the show. He says, you know, we, we got to talk, you know. And I ended up not choosing him. Um, it was a big name. I ended up going with somebody else. I, I got in a couple other galleries, but I ended up taking, go, going with one guy that I met who was just, uh, he, was, he was a hustler. He just had a, he, he, he just had something that I call him the silver-haired fox. He could talk the devil out of his shoes. <laughs> and he was just a phenomenal guy. And, and he just knew how to sell and hustle and promote. And, uh, you know, a lot of things there. And, and at the same time, I met uh, Claudia Wishnow, who uh, said, you have to meet my sister. And she was a New York art dealer who knew everybody. I mean, you know, back to back in Gladwell, you know, you have salespeople, mavens, and connectors. She was all of the th all of three. Uh, you know, she was Maven. She was respected, and then she got me a huge break with uh, Ivan Carp at OK Harris Gallery and uh, in New York, and that that was a major, you know, that was the you know again validation. You know, you needed somebody at that level of credibility to say this is the real deal. This stuff is good. You know, and, and that is going to take that leap of faith with you and sell your work like it was you. Yeah, so they believe yeah. you, they are passionate about your work as much as you are. I think, you know, as, as sto you know, history has shown us, the most successful people say, you know, I need my team and the people that I surround myself right. to be smarter than me. No question. So, you know, as long as you're surrounded with people that are smarter than you, right. you have made the right choice in your life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, the, the people like Charles Schwab and stuff are famous for that. You can take all my money tomorrow, leave me my people. And take their people versus the money because leave me my people and we can double it. You know, we can do this. You know, so it sounds like tomorrow. you really surrounded yourself at that time with people that knew much more than you did. Right. And right. that believed in you. I was lucky. 
Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I know the entrepreneurial, you know, mindset of you create your own luck and the rest of it. Well, yeah, you have to invest in yourself, you have to take risks, but you have to be lucky. You know, you have to attract when, you know, and I believe that. It's like when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so I can't give the credit solely to Ivan Carr for that first show. I'll give more of the credit to Michelle Mosco, who, um, you know, who was the hustler that, that, that went out there to the galleries and had the relationship. She was the one that made it happen. Because sending a couple of JPEG slides you know, to a gallery that's getting you know, 10 packages a week is not the same uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a who you know kind of a thing. And the fact that she was so, you know, intrigued and, and behind the work, that's everything. You know, I, you, you know we've talked about this, yeah. that it's yeah. like, you know, get an artist, get websites, you know, and this and that. It's like, well, yeah. websites don't sell art. People sell art. Yes. You know? Yes, and I think that also now, very different than it used to be before. Galleries used to be very selective on the amount of artists that they represented. Yes. Now, because of the internet, you know, maybe a roster that used to be 20, now it's become 150. Exactly. And there's, because they're trying to be all things to all people and cast a wider net. And um, in many cases, it's been counterproductive for those galleries. So the galleries that are firm with their, their core, you know, stable and keep it, you know, and keep it trim and have that, um, you know, that is a, that's an important thing. And I think that that's something that you want to, as an artist, I looked at that when I made that original decision. Did I want to be with, on that, you know, exclusive street in that best gallery with the best guys as the newcomer, or did I want to be with a smaller gallery where I was, you know, um, you know, and it was it was mixed, but he had some good blue chip stuff. The thing is, it's also you don't want to be the most expensive thing in the gallery, and you know, so you have to find the right fit. But the fit, a lot of it just has to do with what are they, how hard are they willing to work for you? And how, well, sometimes they want an Edward Lynch because of the name and the value that brings them to their own gallery. Correct. Oh, I yeah, and that that's that, that's about the perceptions. I mean, that perception equation is. Um, um, with all art, I think that what you're doing is 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 you you have a story. You you are you you have a rocket that is going somewhere, and that's your vision. That's that's how you connect to things. Is that is that he's going somewhere, and people want to attach their rocket to it. A lot of galleries make up their rosters based on what's hot. I mean, right now, Hunt Sloan. I mean, my God, show after show after show after show. The bunnies, the bunnies, the bunnies. And um, you know, because I have clients, you know, I'm saying, what is this? It's sixty thousand dollars for this painting, you know, and there's a hundred of them everywhere. I mean, nothing against him, he's a cool guy, great story, incredible. But there's a perceived value that galleries sometimes ride the coattails of an artist, whereas sometimes artists ride the coattails of a gallery. And so they're they're two different things. And um, that you know that is something that you become more aware of as you do. If somebody wants an Edward Lynch to begin because they think it's a perfect thing to their stable, you know, I'm, you know, like I say, always say yes, you know, yeah. I mean, you don't. And you, um, you had um, your art dealer or, you know, in this case, a gallery in New York, did they help you then with the market value of your artwork? Yeah, that's interesting, you know, because um, people say, where do you come up with the prices and that kind of thing, and, and, uh, um, being in the international art fairs and the rest of it, um, the dealers really do tell you. I mean, it's like, at this price we can go. And, and for me, the first part of the career was always concerned about bringing the price up by making it things of extraordinary value and, you know, you know the highest price I've got for a single painting was $55,000 uh, collector. <clears throat> that went through a lot of pieces and coming into the studio and, and buying a piece there. And there were pieces like I have, you know, in there, which, you know, the resume doesn't quite catch up to where the value is. And so it's basically comes down to a collector that's gambling and saying there, and, you know, where is your line in the sand? They're very prolific. There are paintings that it's like, I'll sit on them and, you know, forever because I'm not going to compromise that. There's plenty of work that you got to hit those numbers. You have to be a realist. So, but you are you are fortunate enough that you can sit on them, 
and then sell them to the right time and place and, and price. All right. right. Well, <clears throat> it's you leverage that ability by having uh, by by really developing more business sense. You have to. It's in the number. Of what you're doing because because what they tell you in art school is you make a body of work nobody tells you the cost to store the cost to distribute the cost to sell the cost to market you know and you've got uh, 50 paintings that are 10 feet by such and something like that well it goes down to square footage you know how much of that work you know what does it cost for you to store a painting for 10 years and then what is a good price to sell it at so you know, so the best thing is is that prolificness to make work and to keep on making work, and then kind of a you know kind of a formula where it's where really try to save ten percent. Try to try to try to have a, you know don't sell everything. I mean, I within a period of time, it's like everything sells that I'm willing to sell. Right, exactly. The ultimate yeah. goal is autonomous, you know, well, I mean, autonomy, you yeah. know, like, you know, remember uh, Picasso, He's, people waiting in his, in his gallery area all the business I have to sell work right, so right. you try to leverage but, but you know, what I'm listening and hearing is patience could be your biggest virtue because it's, it's my like biggest challenge that's biggest for sure challenge. <laughs> but also patient. your biggest virtue because you sit on it the value increases um, it's almost like wine right it mm. almost gets better in time and um, I think we live right now in a and dry immediately because you want to start, you know, creating layers and going for it um, to selling. Yeah. And I think that, you know, your artwork, um, and we're going to talk about that in a minute because we're going to, uh, we're going to show uh, Ed's studio and talk about his Is a, you know, gestural abstraction is really for that person who needs instant gratification. It's like for me, it's like, you know, I love, you know, drawing and the mark and the stick and that. And I, I love like watching Nancy Hillman and, and yeah. some of her paintings, yeah. like that gestural abstraction, that instant gratification. And, and then you make your technique and your material serve that so you can still stay curation and curatable and archival materials and things, but you, but you uh, want that, uh, that gratification. And, uh, but the patience element is very difficult. Um, it's, it's extremely, for me, patience in it. And it goes even to patience with, with projects, patience with my kids. I mean, you know, it, it, it's very hard to have that patience. Right. But in the end, you know, every artist, you have to believe in yourself. Okay, that big, that, that great paradox I've talked to you about, you know, have to act like a queen to be treated like a queen, you know, you have to, you know, have that, you can only be treated as seriously as you take yourself, but the flip side, the reason why it's a paradox is rule number six, don't take yourself too damn seriously. So how do you <laughs> how balance, do you balance that, that, right, right yeah. you know, and yeah. keep that hard line of making sure it's like, no, you know, and then when I sold for fifty-five thousand, I was like, basically, I have some paintings, but I'm not selling them because these, this is what I want, period, you know. And he's like, let me see this one, and he pulled it out and he looked at his eyes, and he's, that's the one, and it was, and it was no question, and it was like, I just about died of a heart attack because that was a lot of money, <laughs> and it's still a lot of money, you know, and. And, uh, you know, there are paintings that I And have, the cool thing is yeah. that you keep increasing now, and people are, you know, buying, which is yeah, amazing. Yeah, well, on um, a good day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's talk about a little bit of uh, the unique value proposition that you, that 
that you want us to talk about? Well, yeah, I think that, um, you know, uh, and this is more as far as artists are always asking me, you know, kind of, you know, what should I do? And, you know, and I, and I talk about the trade craft of marketing and, and positioning and things like that. And I think that what's really important is to understand how your unique value position, okay, works to get clients, to get dealers, to get representation. The, your value position for me, in my case, is I make books. I have everything self-contained uh, here where I can make crates, I've got expert in logistics, I can have work um, to somebody, if it, I have a truck, a big sprinter truck. We, our, our tagline at the Concierge Fine Art is taking the guesswork out of buying art. We, we think we, we are exceeding expectations, you know, so your value position, what you're bringing to the table. But the important thing to remember with unique value position is that that is what the gallery or the dealer or the representation, the distributor distribution chain brings to you. What is their unique value position? How do they connect the buyer to the seller? And that, in the, when you get to the deeper level of it, then you have to look at the other side of that, which is kind of the yin and the yang of that, which I call the reciprocal value position, okay? So let's say you've got a great, great restaurant. All the best people go there, okay? Now, if a gallery is right next door, that's a great location for the gallery. You're gonna get the spillover fest gallery ever in Santa Fe, right across the street from Geronimo's. Everybody ate at Geronimo's. It was an unbelievable restaurant. The gallery's right there, big line, people are going in there all night long. It was just location, Perfect location, formula. you know? Yeah. And so, uh, but if you're, people, are young artists, and artists will start like a coffee shop or maybe a furniture showroom or maybe a, um, a restaurant or something like that. You have to ask yourself, is their primary business to sell art or to sell something else? If it's not, Okay, you can be, you can do very well maybe in a certain furniture show or something like that. As long as there's a salesperson, as long as somebody that actually is working to sell your work. The you know, in other words, you're just decorating a restaurant. You're just decorating something you're putting on the wall, and this is not this is not good for yourself. This is a this is lowering what you should have. Like I say, you have to act like the queen of the Like when you need. You, know, you need to be the center of attention and not the second second center of attention. Right, like let's say websites don't sell art, people sell art. Yeah. It's a it is a very you know, a good dealer that knows how to sell art, it's a very rare. I mean is tell me an artist that isn't looking for no matter how you're, good they are, yeah. no matter how well they are, tell me they're not looking for somebody who's really a sharp dealer that really knows how to sell. I mean I've known these people. I've known guys I know a guy that was in a furniture showroom, and when he left, sales just went down. Nothing, because nobody knows how to sell a piece of art. This guy, boom, he just, somebody's there, bam, bam, he just, he just had it. He just, he, he you know what I mean? There's a finesse yes. to it. Yes. And uh, so that, that value position is what you bring to the table. It's what your distributors, you make your choices based on the value of position that they bring. And you have to, you have to look at that reciprocal value position. And make sure that it's that it's you know this is a win win. Yeah, yeah. So right now we're gonna start walking around, and you guys are in for a treat. <laughs> um, we don't do um, Ed doesn't do this very often, so I'm super excited um, that he's. You're the first us. one. I know. <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you for trusting me. Uh, so Casey is helping us. Thank you so much. Um, so um, let's talk about right here because. I know we can't even pull these guys out, but just for you oh, to I... <laughs> see, um, you know, how short I am <laughs> compared to those pieces right there. Um, so, Ed, talk to us about Sure. This. Well, this one here is the three panels, and if anybody looks at my website, I think they'll see me standing like this uh, back in uh, 07 or something like maybe 10 or something like that next to this one, and it's 11 feet tall by 16 feet, 16 feet wide, it's three panels. It's called the Ars Magna, after the, the, uh, the it's like a great paper, I do a lot of things in history. This one here is a piece that's like 11 feet by 8 feet 
Um, you know, these are, you know, other pieces. I have a piece that's down there a little bit that's six panels that stands 13 feet tall when it's assembled and 21 feet wide. Um, and then I've got some big, uh, uh, I've got another triptych, this 100 by 150 done in 50 by 100 inch panels uh, as a triptych, but they're done pinched together and then we take them apart to show them, but then, but they're done so that they're very seamless yeah. in there, so they're not like a triptych, they right, have spaces in between them, yeah. so they look, so you, you know, very clean. So you need a really clean. specific, special yeah. place to display those. Yeah. So I'm going to move this um, light right here so we can talk about um, this artwork right here. Um, so, oh yeah, so <laughs> this one here, um, uh, I had a couple of others, and we put a this this kind of frame. We're using this palladium glass. It's a it's a Gusto Manetti white gold, and so it's a gold frame. But but this piece here, this is a uh, this would be the the poster boy for less is more. Um, because I when I was first working with this piece, I couldn't get the color right, and I kept on using layers and layers of more epoxy, and then I was putting all my pearls and these are cast, flat, cast glass butterflies and it was dipping a little bit. I didn't, it was in the earlier part of these pieces where I learned that I needed to um, create a very flat tensile strength um, using some, some fill in that because otherwise when they're laying flat, the, the canvas, the weight of it would pool and so it became harder where it would distort and make things go in the middle so looking like orbs and stuff. And so to get rid of that, and I kept on working it and working it and the glazes, and I wasn't paying attention to it because <laughs> I was early to it, to realize that what I had done is put a couple hundred pounds worth of resin and plus the construction of the painting. So with the frame, this thing's about 400 pounds now. So. I don't 400 know. pounds, people. <laughs> I don't know, we're going to sell it. But, <laughs> but I mean, I have seen huge brass, you know, uh, yeah. bronze reliefs yeah, from, you know, yeah. so the right space. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is really typical of the texture and the, and the heavy, you know, pasta and the way that I work to build the ground and things. Um, this one was a long painting. It, it, it started a long time ago and then it rested um, for several years. It was just in storage. And then I pulled it out and then I reworked it again. And what I was trying to do is I was working with some new stuff. It's, it's hard to tell anything, but it's ultra flat. There's no, there's no, the, the flatness is, is something that um, in painting matte, you know, matte, matte, ultra matte finish. And uh, achieve that. Let me just say matte. that flat and matte are. Uh, uh, different. This is very three dimensional with all the uh, you know, right, yeah, right, right, right. that you're using. By saying flat, meaning it, mm. it's, it, it's, it has no shine. No it has shine, no, right, right. You know, no shine whatsoever. So there's no reflection. So, there's so no the reflection. intensity so actually, of the chroma comes it out actually so much comes more. Out. Yeah. And um, I think that because of all the uh, you know mixed media that we have in here, the absorption of the paint. Uh, even makes the color pop even more. Right. Yeah. And that's and that's part of you know that's the technique is by design. The idea that what I'm using when I'm using um, stone dust and masonry shale and and uh, mastics and and things. I'm not only trying to make sure that I've got this. There's no dips. There's no ripples. This I'm using a poplar. Um, you know, very engineered canvas so it can take stretch and they never warp. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of science between how you making the product, you know, the paint work for you versus against you. And so there's absorption and you can see it more in this kind of painting here where more natural, where part of it is, is totally about flatness. I mean, this this zero shine and the absorption and then the contrast here, um, contrast of of you know uh, my colors and and this is this is really pretty much kind of the signature um, style Lynch. that yes. that yes. really launched my career. Yes. It was yes. like this was 
unique and it's you know it, you have to add something. I think that that's important for for artists. At least that's what you know. You know, one of my mentors at one point is that you have to have something where somebody looks at it and says, "Hey, that's the sound of Phelan BCS." Okay, and that's an Edward Lynch where there's something. Um, you look at a at a Skip Lipke, you know, a Malcolm Lipke, an incredible painter who just just flew it. I've seen him paint, and it's just impressive. And and although there are a few people that that are kind of doing some things that look like this. In most cases, you look at it, and even though, you know, it's a traditional guy that's doing kind of scenes, bar scenes, people smoking a cigarette, you know, figurative stuff. Um, it just, you know, there, are, there is art when you yeah. look at it and say that's definitely yeah. a so-and-so. And this is like a real, not objective art where it has all the mark makings, it has all the mixed media, it has depth because of the saturation, the different saturation on a very limited palette, um, which really creates this incredible conversation between what you have of, you know, marks going horizontally, vertically. You have a community of marks right here. And so what, what you've created is that your eye really goes all around it. And you don't really necessarily have to have a focal point here. You kind of go around it, which is phenomenal. I mean, I think that once you have mastered that and you are a master of that, um, you've made it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's it, it's just something that it never it's uh, the fund is never exhausted. Um, but at the same time, you know, that was something that a, the great art dealer told me, Evan Carr. He said, "When the fund is exhausted, work becomes shallow, weak, and repetitive." And so that's when. You know, at certain points, I always have to be breaking through. You always have to try something. I dream. I, I have a dream at night, and I'll see myself in a room full of paintings. And that will be the next direction of the next collection. I mean, and that was what happened with these, uh, with these butterfly pieces. And that, um, I start out with small ones. It's like I wanted to make something that's like a Fabergé egg. And it's just, just exceptionally you know, lush, and, and that's where yeah. I started with the resin work, and then the next thing I end up with there was this, with this black and white, this, this uh, technique, and, and so I'm still working with the same base and impasto, and, and then, but I've got, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, you're constantly increasing your vocabulary painting, you know what I mean? You, you, like, like the milk, like the milk on the paper, right? you know. It's Did like, you see that? Yeah, yeah. Isn't I was like, crazy? okay, that's 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 yeah. vocabulary, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So, um, how many pieces do you think you produce in a year? Well, that's a, that's a good question, and uh, so I would say that the, the the you know in a good year, fifty, seventy-five, maybe, um, you know, uh, maybe you know, somewhere in that range, you know, but, um, but that's part of the math we were talking about, is that to have a studio and the overhead and, and the, you know, everything you need, the cost to maintain a business, a full-time studio like that, you got about a $50,000 overhead a year. So if you don't make 50 paintings, you know, and you, you know what the conversion is? If you had a fifty thousand dollar <laughs> overhead, doesn't matter that doesn't it's only matter. it's only twenty dollars worth of wood and fifteen dollars worth of canvas and you know fifty dollars worth of paint or this, something. This it's expensive. the overhead. Yes. This is expensive work. This so is expensive, just the material alone. So what I think that you have become through your years is a chemist. <laughs> um, I think this is your lab. You come here. You don't even know what to expect, but you're, you know, constantly mixing and finding new That's, that's and right. They're I constantly mean, uh, changing as well. Yeah. Like an oil painting base does not change oil painting, but maybe the, the resins, the way you actually apply the resins or you know, you know more of all the stuff that you've been using through the years, but I feel like it's almost like your lab, your personal lab. It's a, well, I, mean, I consider myself a polymath, you know, I mean, it, and alchemy is part of that, uh, the alchemist is part of that polymath, you know, polymath is you know, that's using many different techniques and mind spaces and bringing them together, you know, my work is about defining synectics, and synectics is this um, you know, something that's beyond brainstorming. It's something that's, that's existing on multiple levels. It's like you practice the scales 
in, you know, over and over and over again, piano or violin, to get to the point where you're at total fluidity, where, you know, but you have to have that basics and stuff. For me, painting, everything I know about painting, and I studied, you know, uh, classical painting in Paris at the Academy of Grand Chimier. I started with many different teachers, and everything about painting is underpainting. A good painting is always about the underpainting, the ground, the rest of it. Look at what makes a Rembrandt, or what makes a Monet, or what makes a Picasso. It's not the final paint on the top, it's what's <laughs> it's the underpainting. And how long it takes for the <laughs> underpainting to take place. Yeah, it's, right? a, and it's how many, build, and there's how many layers and layers, right. it's layers right, and yeah, layers yeah. And layers. that's the lushness, is that there's layers and layers and, and layers of, of pieces, and, and, but freshness, you know, there has to be that, that fluidity, there has to be that, that, that magic spark, where maybe in an hour, if you got the painting perfect, that it's got everything that you want in, but glazes and this and that and the rest of it takes several weeks just to get what you got finished. You know what I mean? Right. It's like there, there's, right. there's the intention, but then and there's then the tradecraft to make it archival and to make it solid and, you know, and make sure that it doesn't fade and, and these type of things because, you know, um, that's what I'm working with is also stuff that, uh, um, you know, I want sun to be able to beat on it and not to change it, not to right. birth. You know? Right, right, right. And um, so I see here what you're talking about, you know, doing a diptych and you can't really, I mean, once you put them together. Um, yeah, when they're tight you know, like that, yeah. this one. Yeah. This piece, I, I, you know, nice as a, as a, as a, you know, the two of them in a conversation on different walls, but, uh, but this was, this is the most recent painting. This was special. This is, um, of all the different things that I'm doing, um, this is where I go home. You know, this is where I just safe. This is my safe. thing. It's just you know, it's it's the place where it just brings brings me to that perfect space. You know, I mean, it's just it's like it's a meditation. For me. And the fact that I see the smile on your face that still <laughs> makes you very it's happy. Still, yeah, I, I love right? this painting. Yeah, I mean, I, if you come close here, um, you can really see the amount of texture. How how much? Do you think they weigh? Oh, this one, these are, you know, 40 pounds, you know, not, they're not overly heavy, but they are, they're solid because of the, the kind of canvas. I mean, um, you know, we use uh, a poplar that we mill and do everything ourselves, so it's straight, it's a good paint grade, it's not, you know, poplar is a very good wood that, uh, that won't warp, that it will hold its... It's, so um, uh, temperature-wise, it doesn't matter if in a building it's cold or hot, it won't... Yeah, and that's, you know, the, um, what I found out early um, was that you need to make things really indestructible. You know, a lot of people working in acoustic paintings, and uh, I was working in some acoustic at a certain point, and Beautiful. The technique is incredible. I love encaustic. Any encaustic art, I love it. But I heard gallery after gallery after gallery saying that the maintenance on trying to handle those things is, you know, not worth the risk because they end up damaging them and the artists have to fix them and it's not, you know, and so there is a challenge there. And so for me, you know, I, I like that old commercial, it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. I mean, I know that there are going to be monkeys that are going to be knocking this stuff around. I want the stuff to, you know. And then the, like, the resin stuff, I mean, you know, this stuff is just indestructible. I mean, you can put a, you know, you can try to key it and yeah. <laughs> scratch it. Yeah, yeah. So. And let's just talk about, like, how you do your circular um ones right here. Um, well, I have, uh, uh, I work with a shop that's in Missouri, uh, a couple old guys, the only ones that I really have been able to work with that can make them my custom, they have a CNC router, um, so they make the pieces to my specification and frames as well, and the frames fit. This is a framed piece here. Um, can you see it? Oh, yeah. Azabachi Pearl. The light isn't great over here, but um, this is uh, palladium glass again. This is the the, the gold leaf that we put on, yeah. and um, so there. Uh, uh, and I've got some other pieces that are 
here as well. This is a bunch of frame stuff and uh, some pieces there. So we're gonna go now um, to see and talk all about your new adventure making masks and also, um, you know, let's just talk about, you know, how you make your uh, catalogs, um, how beautiful they are and how important it is to have a catalog uh, to either sell or give out to galleries. I hear you. Well, that's something I really like to talk about because uh, this, um, these catalogs that I'm, that I'm doing, um, took a long time. When I first started doing it, I was actually using like zebra wood splines and we were printing single pages like that. And it would be like one of the first things that I would tell artists because these books have gotten me six figure commissions. What you want to do is, first of all, I think Creative Cloud is an amazing tool. It used to be you had to buy a Photoshop license, you had to do this. Now you can do a monthly service and everything including tutorials and everything else, InDesign, Photoshop, Muse for websites, Premiere Pro for basic videos. I mean, you can be master of your own world. The, the information's out there. You can get a simple subscription for great you know, uh, tutorials, you can make this stuff. I've been working with Kevin Brown for 20 years. Kevin Brown at um, SmartSet and yep. Meta. And we've gone through so many different generations of making products for me to send People. This is what you call your collateral, you know, yeah, your market collateral. Yeah. And so this is a perfect bound. Um, it printed, it cranks these things out. I can do small batches. The quality is incredible. Forget about this, you know, MacBooks on command and this kind of stuff. It's not even close. He can work with typesetting and make sure that they have incredible design people there. <laughs> this one, because I've got a big deal coming up here with some people. Um, he was able to crank this out and make me some of these um, literally within just a couple of days we were able to just solid us up. I had all the images, I put it together and this is, a, this, is this book that's reinventing Edward Lynch. So basically <clears throat> as this year started uh, again for branding and other things I really wanted to evolve myself from just Edward Lynch the painter to more Edward Lynch the style guru. And so uh, wall coverings I created using the textures of my paintings, the wall coverings and rugs. And then I went into some whole couture stuff, doing these really great cashmere scarves. It was all because of Nordstrom's actually. Uh, so I kept on doing all these commissions and I was always end up with this really masculine stuff and the black and the gray and the, in the men's department. And I have loved scarves forever. And I'm looking and I'm going, you know, there's nothing really cool out there. So that's where I came up with it. Then COVID hits, the factory in India closes down. And, and it brings voila. me to, okay, <laughs> I find a US, uh, it's, a, it's an Allegro roll to roll printer. And they're really expensive, but they're, they print on fabric. So I find one in Ohio. And I got a great friend who I'm in a mastermind with, which, Again, artists, you have to have a tribe, you have to have a mastermind, you have to have people that you communicate with, share ideas, and brainstorm. That's how you make things happen. And uh, so, she did the same <clears throat> problem as me. <clears throat> the uh, uh, COVID hits, I've got 12 locations with all my products. This isn't all my product, this is just a few pages. Right. I've got product in 12 locations, it's going to London, and brick and mortar is shut down. Okay, they have nothing. And so we're going, okay, so there's still sales, and actually sales because of the nesting, the clientele, people are focusing on empty walls, and there, there's, you know, there's actually some, you know, silver lining, I guess, if everything right. is shut down, right. if there's still some selling, and, and by, whatever, you know, the skin of my teeth, there's been actually some great activity and some good sales there. But um, I wanted to do something for a long time. See, when I, the artist giving pledge, I think you know something about that. Yep. Donated the paintings. I had this amazing night at the, the Super Bowl party where two paintings ended up selling for $93,000 that went to charity. And, and I had a couple others with Bill Shatner and some other, um, uh, the Buddy Kravitz thing, there's a few different shows. and you know, events and stuff. And so donating paintings to raise money for 
Jerry has always been, you know, really important to me. I think it's great. I, I, you know, it's really a way that I can be relevant. You know, artists have to find a way to be relevant. You know, there's a pass the toothbrush test. You know, so the so, couture was the way to go. The uh, this the the mask the haute couture this does pass the toothbrush test. Everybody needs one, and it's. It's something that's propriety. You don't want to share it. You know, you, you, it's something that's yours. It's something that you hold. But what's even more important is that it's B to C, business to customer. It can scale to go business to business. So I can, at wholesale, the factory I'm working with, she can crank out thousands of these, and she's doing that. It can go, even most importantly, B to P, being business to philanthropy. So I contacted Mark uh, Pollock, who runs the Giving Back Fund, who um, basically, you know, because of that, that was through their organization at the Super Bowl, they work with, he's got 19 COVID foundations with uh, famous athletes and entertainers and that, they're all doing stuff. So, so I sent, you know, some of the product to him. I reached out to Donna Karen, it's all over that she loves it. And so, you know, we've got this thing that can, the mask can be sold can help her business, it can help me, but at the same time, I'm looking at something that I like this philanthrocapitalism model. I love this idea of artists doing things to give to get. You have to give, you have to give back. And if you, artists want to become more relevant, I think, and more um, respected. See, we wear stereotypes out there. Going to a bank as an artist and see if you can borrow money, okay? We wear stereotypes, but we have to bust those stereotypes by saying we want to see at the big table, we have to bring something to the table. And giving back, figuring out a good strategy that helps fundraising, helps organizations, stuff like that, artists got to do that. That's what will take artists and restore our kind of credibility and our, you know, and, and, and inspiring think, people. You know, I, I feel very proud of my project. Because exactly, you're doing exactly, everything right. That is exactly what you're talking about. Yep. I'm bringing a community of artists that are giving, and we just made ten thousand dollars for Feeding America. Exactly. Congratulations! So, that I saw that that was fabulous, and that's what you know. And and what feels better? It's like painting. You yeah. know, you do it to feel yeah. good. We are deliverers of happiness. Yes. You know, yes. that's what yes. our primary job is. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Well, I just. Um, I want to thank you for your time, for your generosity, for opening your studio for the first time I'm ever. Honest. I'm still smiling. I, uh, I hope you can tell that I'm smiling too. We are um, just, uh, I can't thank you enough. This well, was a wonderful you. experience. Thank you for trusting me, uh, for coming in here. And Casey, thank you for filming. You're welcome. And everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here with us. And we will see you on Saturday. At noon. So thank you again, guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. All on? right. Yeah. Oh, that's that's perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't do the questions. Too much. No, that's okay. Were there we any didn't questions? Get the questions, but people weren't really.